So last class we were going through several examples on LMTD methods, right? And um, we were solving these uh, uh, heating water in a counterflow heat exchanger. And uh, we have two currents of water, one being geothermal water, right? And the other one uh, being just cold water, regular water. And um, we were trying to find the length of the heat exchanger required to achieve the desired heating, uh, knowing that the overall heat transfer coefficient for this heat exchanger is 640. And we said, or we were evaluating um, a common um, solution technique that requires to get the missing temperature, right? Because as you can see, we have only one temperature for the geothermal water, and we don't have the outlet temperature for the geothermal water. So the idea was to um, do the energy balance on the cold water, because that's the stream where we know both temperatures, right? Um, so we can get the missing temperature out of, um, out of the, that we have both temperatures available. So that's a very common way to solve um, this kind of problems when dealing with the LMTD method. And um, we then uh, perform the energy balance right on the, um, on the cold stream water uh, because we know the mass flow rate, we can get the CP from tables, and we know that two temperatures is very important, right? 20 and 80. So if we uh, just calculate the heat transfer rate for this uh, heat exchanger uh, from the cold stream water, we get 301 kilowatts. And now that we know the heat that is supplied by the geothermal water, we can get the the outlet temperature for the geothermal water, right? So uh, we just, again, apply the energy balance, but now to the geothermal current, right? And what we don't know is T out. So um, then we can get T out out of here, out of this equation, and we just plug here the value of the heat transfer rate for the other current, because whatever the hot current um, loses, right, the, the cold stream gains. So we get the temperature out for the geothermal water being 125 Celsius. Okay, so now that we know the both inlet and outlet temperatures for geothermal water and the cold water stream, we can now calculate our delta T, right? So we can apply the logarithm temperature equation. So delta T1 is going to be um, hot in minus cold out, so 160 minus 80, and delta T2 hot, uh, hot out minus cold in, 125 minus 20, 105. And then we apply our equation um, for log mean temperature difference, right? 80 minus 105, natural log of 80, 105. And this would be 92 Celsius. So we know, um, we know uh, the overall heat transfer coefficient because it is given. Uh, we know the heat transfer rate because we calculated, and we know logarithm and temperature difference. Uh, we don't require here a correction factor. Why? Because it's not shell and tube or cross flow heat exchanger. So then what we don't know is the surface area. And once we know the surface area, we can get the uh, length out of the equation for the surface area pi dl, right? So let's get the surface area, right? We plug the heat transfer rate, the overall heat transfer coefficient, and the delta T log that we calculate here. So we have an area of 5.11 meter square. Now that we uh, have the surface area, we can calculate the length uh, of the tube, right? Length equals the surface area divided by pi d. And that gives us 108 meters. So the inner tube of this control flow heat exchanger needs to be over 100 meters long to achieve the desired heat transfer, which is impractical. So in cases like this, we need to use a plate uh, heat exchanger or multipass shell and tube heat exchanger with multiple passes of tube bundles. So that means we need to design a shell and tube heat exchanger 
in order to make um, in, in order to make this uh, heat transfer rate possible, right? Because hundred more than hundred meters is is not practical. So what I'm trying to do is to solve each type of heat exchanger you can face with with this method. So you can learn how to solve each type of heat exchanger. So now let's move to the cross flow. So we have a radiator and the problem says a test is conducted to determine the overall heat transfer coefficient in an automotive radiator that is a compact cross flow water to air heat exchanger with both fluids, air and water and mix. The radiator has 40 tubes of internal diameter, so you can see here in the image, right? Um, 40 tubes of internal diameter of 0.5 centimeters and length of 65 centimeters in a closed space plate fin matrix. So you can he see here the fins, right? The plated fin matrix. Hot water enters the tubes at 90 here at a rate of 0.6 kilograms per second and leaves at 65 Celsius. So leaves here, right? Air flow, so the air is passing through the interfine spaces, right? And it's heated from 90 to 40. Determine the overall heat transfer coefficient, UI, of this radiator based on the inner surface area of the tubes. And we know that is based on the inner area because we have a UI there, right? If we have a U naught, um, that would mean based on the outer surface area, right? Um, we are going to read a specific read heat um, of water, or it is given at the average temperature of 90 inlet and 65 outlet. So that specific heat at 77.5 Celsius is 4.195 kilojoules per kilogram Celsius. So first of all, we are using LMTD method. Would this heat exchanger would require a correction factor? Yes, right, because it's cross flow. So uh, that means we will need to read this correction factor from a figure and you need to locate the right figure uh, for this heat exchanger while solving it. So we have the specific heat. So the rate of heat transfer in this radiator from the hot water to the air can be determined from an energy balance on the water flow. Why on the water flow? Because we are given the mass flow rate, right? And the two temperatures. We are given a flow, mass flow rate of water of 0.6 kilograms per second. So essentially we have all data to work with this uh, water stream. So mass flow rate times CP times delta T give us 62.93 kilowatts. Uh, we need to calculate also the tube side heat transfer area, right? Uh, because we require to calculate our overall heat transfer coefficient in terms of the inner area. So that would be pi inner diameter length times the number of tubes we have in there. And the problem says you have 40 tubes. So pi times inner diameter times the length of the tubes times 40, because we have 40 tubes there. So that will give us a tube, tube side heat transfer area, right, being 0 0.408 meters squared. So now that we know the rate of heat transfer and the surface area, we can determine the overall heat transfer coefficient from our heat transfer equation similar to Newton's cooling law. Right, overall heat transfer coefficient times inner area, both inner, right, because the problem required to calculate for inner, uh, times the correction factor, because we are dealing with a cross flow, times delta T logarithm. So we have the heat transfer rate at this point, we have the area, we don't know the correction factor, but we can get it. And uh, after getting um, the correction factor, right, uh, we can just, um, we can just correct the delta T log with that correction factor. So all we don't know is the overall heat transfer coefficient. So overall heat transfer coefficient equals heat transfer rate, area correction factor, delta T log. So let's start with delta T log as always, right? Uh, let's start with delta T1, that it will be hot in minus cold out. 
So 90 minus 40 equals 50. Delta T2 hot out minus cold in. It would be 65 minus 20, 45. Delta T log, uh, we do delta T1 minus delta T2 natural log of uh, delta T1 divided by delta T2 give us 47.6 Celsius. We need to calculate P and Z in this textbook. It's not R, it's Z. Um, to read the figure. And we are going to read figure 1017, right? Because that gives us the correction factor to counter flow LMTD for a cross flow heat exchanger with both fluids on mixed and one tube pass, right? Both tubes, both fluids are on mixed. Why they are on mixed? Because we have fins, right? Remember that the mixed case, we, we don't have fins, right? That help us to direct the fluid and prevent the mixing, right? So we will be using them figure 1017, right? But to read figure 1017, we need to calculate this T and this C, right? In order to locate which curve we are going to read, then go all the way to the left side and read our correction factor for a cross flow with both fluids on mixed. So P is uh, the temperature, uh, the temperature of the tubes out minus temperature of the tube in divided by temperature of the shell in minus temperature of the tube in. So we have 65 minus 90 divided by 20 minus 90 equals 0.36. So same thing for C, this is Z in this textbook. 20 minus 40 divided by 65 minus 90. Uh, we have for P 36 and for Z 0.8. So P 36 more or less here, right? And for C we have 0.8, so 0.8 a would be this line here, right? So we are located here. And we go all the way to the left and around 97, 90 C um, should be fine. Should be a good reading, 0 0.96, 0 0.97. As always for reading chart, I expect that you do a good reading, right? A, a bad reading would be if you tell me you read 0 0.7 or uh, even 0.9, we change a lot the the result, right? So just be sure that you read properly these kind of um, correction factors. So 0.97, um, so 0.97, so we have everything. We have delta T log, we have correction factor, we have the area, we have heat transfer rate. So we can calculate the um, overall heat transfer coefficient based on the inner area. Uh, being 3341 watt meter square Celsius. So just as a note here, it says that the overall heat transfer coefficient on the air side will be much lower because of the large surface area involved in that side. But we are, we are adding fins. So that is for the LMTD method. Okay, so let's start with the NTU method, the epsilon NTU method. And we are going to cover essentially the effectiveness or NTU method. And it was a method developed in 1955 that it was developed to simplify the heat exchanger analysis. That was the main driving force for um, developing this method. So the LMTD method that we just analyzed, right, is a straightforward when the fluid temperatures are known, right? or when you can apply the energy balance to one of the currents where you know both temperatures and get the missing temperature, right? Like we did in the last problem. So that's, um, that's straightforward. So you have four temperatures or you have a way to get the missing temperatures go for L LMTD. Uh, but frequently we don't know the outlet temperatures. And in that case, uh, we need to use an iterative LMTD. So uh, someone didn't like much iteration. So to, in order to avoid iteration, uh, we came out with the epsilon NTU method. And this method is based on a dimensionless parameter called the effectiveness, the epsilon, right? 
That's why we have the, e, the epsilon before the name of the method. So epsilon is the ratio of actual heat transfer rate divided by the maximum possible heat transfer rate. And we can have values of epsilon that range from zero to one. So as you can see from this equation, the epsilon NTU method is based on the principle that the actual heat transfer that occurs between the fluids is a fraction of the maximum heat transfer possible, right? Actual divided by max. And what is the maximum possible heat transfer? So the maximum heat transfer possible will occur when you have a counterflow heat exchanger with infinite surface area, right? So that is what we define as the mo maximum possible heat transfer. But as you can see from the epsilon equation, we need to know also the actual heat transfer, right? And the actual heat transfer rate can be determined from an energy balance. And it's the equation that I have here on top on this blue box. So the actual heat transfer rate equals um, C or heat capacity of the hot fluid times the temperature of the cold fluid out minus temperature of the cold fluid in equals to the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid times the temperature of the hot fluid in minus the temperature of the hot fluid out. The heat capacity rate is a quantity of heat, a flowing fluid of certain mass flow rate is able to absorb or release per unit of temperature, per unit temperature change per unit time. And this capacity, heat capacity rate, sorry, is defined here, right? Is the mass flow rate times the specific heat, where C is for hot and H is for cold. So now we define already heat capacity rate. Now let's define when the maximum possible heat transfer and the, ma the maximum possible heat transfer rate can be determined from delta T max that delta T max is the largest possible temperature difference and is defined as the difference of the hot in minus the cold in. Also, it is important to mention that the fluid with a smaller heat capacity rate will experience the maximum temperature difference. Then what we need to do first is to calculate the heat capacity rates for the hot and the cold. Determine which one has the lowest value of the heat capacity rate. And that is going to be our C minimum or heat capacity rate minimum. And in the case, the heat capacity rate of the cold fluid is smaller than the heat capacity rate of the cold. We can calculate Q max with this equation, with the minimum one, the smallest one that in this case is the heat capacity of the cold. So, the heat capacity rate of the cold times the largest possible temperature difference is going to give us Q max. Same thing applies when the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid is the smallest one. So uh, the heat capacity rate, when the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid is smaller than the heat capacity rate of the cold fluid, then we calculate with that Q max with that smaller value, the hot one, times the largest possible temperature difference. And I know it's too much, but once we do a problem, you will see it's not that complicated. So I think you will understand this better once we do a problem and check that. So um, we are going to solve an upper limit for heat transfer in a heat exchanger. And we have cold water that enters a counterflow heat exchanger at 10 Celsius and a rate of eight kilograms per second, but it is heated by hot water stream that enters the heat exchanger at 70 at a rate of two kilograms per second. Assume the specific heat of water to remain constant and be in 4.18 kilojoules per kilogram Celsius. Determine the maximum heat transfer rate at the, and the outlet temperatures of the cold and the hot streams for this limiting case. So as you can see, even if I don't tell you that this is an epsilon NTU um, problem, right? You will see that the problem is requiring the two outlet temperatures. So you have missing two temperatures. That means that 
It's kind of difficult that you solve with LMTD, right? So what I'm going to do first, the specific heat of the water is given, right? And we have two water currents. So it's the same CP for both currents. What I'm going to do, I'm going to calculate the heat capacity rate for the hot and cold fluids, right? So let's calculate the heat capacity rate for the hot fluid. The heat capacity rate for the hot fluid is the mass flow rate of the hot fluid times the CP for the hot fluid. So two kilograms, that is the mass flow rate of the hot, times the CP of the hot is water. So water in both cases, CP is the same. So we have a value of um, the hot heat capacity rate of 8.36. Now let's repeat for the cold stream. Heat capacity rate of the cold stream is mass flow rate of the cold stream times the CP of the cold stream. It's water, so CP again is the same. We just multiply the same CP by the current or the mass flow rate of the cold fluid. So that gives us 33.4. We compare these two values and we realize that the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid is smaller, right? Then we need to calculate Q max with the smaller one, the hot heat capacity rate times the maximum delta T, hot in minus cold in, right? So let's calculate Q max here. So Q max is equal to heat capacity rate minimum, that in this case is the hot one, times hot, the difference of temperatures of hot in minus cold in, right? Hot in is 70, cold in is 10. So the minimum times the delta T of the hot cold in. That gives us 502 kilowatts. And this is the maximum possible heat transfer rate in this heat exchanger, right? Because we calculate with the minimum heat capacity rate and the maximum delta T. So this value would be approached in a counterflow heat exchanger with a very, very, very large heat transfer surface area because it's what we define as the maximum, right? The maximum temperature difference in this heat exchanger is going to be hot in minus cold in, right? That is going to be 60. Therefore, the hot water cannot be cooled by more than 60 to 10 in this heat exchanger, and the cold water cannot be heated more than 60 to 70, no matter what we do. Then we can get, knowing this, this limiting case, the outlet temperatures of the cold and hot fluid streams in this limiting case, because it was the problem asked. Calculate for this limiting case. So I apply the heat transfer rate, uh, the heat transfer balance, right? Uh, heat transfer rate equals heat capacity of the cold multiplied by cold out minus cold in. I don't know cold out, so I take out cold out out of here. So this is equals T cold in plus the heat transfer rate that we calculate here divided by heat capacity rate of the cold, right? So temp plus uh, heat transfer rate and the heat capacity that we calculated for the cold one in the previous slide. That gives me 25 Celsius. I repeat the same analysis, but now to get the hot out, right? So heat capacity rate of the hot multiplied by temperature of the hot in minus hot out. I don't know hot, hot out, so I take it out of the equation. Hot in uh, minus heat transfer rate TH or heat capacity rate of the hot. That gives me 10 Celsius. So just a little note, and I just want that we show, look at this blue thing because it's the most important thing. Uh, note that the hot water is cooled to the limit of 10, the inlet temperature of the cold water stream, but the cold water is heated to 25 only when maximum heat transfer occurs in the heat exchangers. This is not surprising since the mass flow rate of the hot water is only one fourth that of the cold water. As a result, the temperature of the cold water increases by 0.20 Celsius for each one Celsius drop in the temperature of the hot water. So is due to the mass flow rate essentially? as you can see. And what I wanted that you uh, observe 
mainly from this problem is how to calculate the heat capacity rate, how to decide what is the minimum, and how to calculate the max. So we haven't still solved a problem with the epsilon NCU method. I'm just showing a step by step how to do calculations so we can put together a, a problem when employing the whole entire procedure or method to solve uh, heat exchangers by N epsilon NTU. So let's see now how to calculate effectiveness. Uh, we already learned how to calculate the um, heat transfer and the um, the heat capacity rate, right? So we have a counter flow double pipe heat exchanger and we are, the uh, is to heat water, so water from 20 to 80 here at a rate of 1.2 kilograms per second. The heating is to be accomplished by geothermal water here, right? Available at 160 Celsius at a mass flow rate of two kilograms per second. The inner tube is thin wall and has a diameter of 1.5 centimeters, as you can see here in the drawing. If the overall heat transfer coefficient of the heat exchanger, so the overall heat transfer coefficient is given as 640 watt meters square Celsius, determine the effectiveness of the heat exchanger. So we need to calculate epsilon in this case. Um, to know, to calculate epsilon, what do we need? Q actual and Q max, right? Because epsilon is the ratio of Q actual and Q max. Um, so in order to get Q max, what we do? Find the heat capacity rates, right? Determine which one is the smallest one and use that one to calculate Q max. So let's do it. Let's calculate the heat capacity rates of the cold and hot fluid and identify the smaller one. So the heat capacity of the hot fluid uh, is going to be mass flow rate of the hot fluid times the CP of the hot fluid, right? That is just regular water. Um, um, then, um, no, sorry, hot is the geothermal. So this value is for the geothermal water. Sorry about that. So. Hot uh, heat capacity rate of the hot mass flow rate of the hot times the CP of the geothermal water. Give us 8.62. Uh, we repeat the same thing for the cold water, mass flow rate of the cold water that is 1.2 kilograms per second times the CP of the cold water. And we get a value of 502. Then if we compare these two values, right? And uh, the heat capacity rate of the cold fluid is smaller than the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid. Then the minimum heat capacity rate is for the cold fluid. If that's the case, we are going to calculate Q max with the heat capacity rate of the cold fluid times the maximum delta T. That is hot in minus cold in. So 5.02 times hot in that is 160 minus cold in, that is 20, right? So we have a maximum heat transfer rate of 702.8 kilowatts. What we need, need next to calculate epsilon? The actual, the actual heat transfer rate in the heat exchanger can be calculated with uh, the water stream. Why? Because we know both temperatures, right? So we can apply an energy balance, MTP delta T for the water, and get the actual heat transfer rate for the heat exchanger. So we know M, mass flow rate, we know CP, and we know the delta T of the water. That gives us 301 kilowatts. And now the effectiveness becomes actual divided by max. So 301 divided by 702, right? So that gives us a value of epsilon of 0.4. So as you already realize, once you have the effectiveness of the heat exchanger, you can calculate the actual heat transfer rate, right? And I mean, you just multiply Q max by epsilon. Um, it is important to mention that the effectiveness of the heat exchanger depends on the geometry of the heat exchanger and the flow arrangement. And 
once we go through the me method formally, you will realize that from the tables. Another way to calculate epsilon can be by this equation, delta T minimum of the fluid divided by the maximum temperature difference in the heat exchanger. So that's an alternative way. But the most common way is the one that we already analyzed. So as I already mentioned here, the effectiveness depends on the geometry and the flow arrangement. Then um, effectiveness relations were developed for a large number of heat exchangers and the results are given in tables. And you have tables in your textbook. In, in each table, in this case for this textbook, temp three. So is this one? So these are effectiveness equations depending on the flow arrangements and the geometry of the heat exchanger. And also the effectiveness of some common types of heat exchangers are plotted in figures, in figures 1018 to 1022 in your textbook. So this table, people have developed also um, graphs from these equations and you have graphs for heat exchanger on parallel flow, counter flow, you have also shell and tube with one well baffled shell pass and two or a multiple of two tube passes. Heat exchanger effectiveness for cross flow with both fluid mixed and heat exchanger effectiveness for cross flow with one fluid mixed and the other unmixed. So you have the two options. You can use the table or you can use the plot. Obviously, the analytic relations or the equations in table 10.3 give more accurate results than the chart because you can make errors while reading the charts, right? And also the equations are very suitable for computerized analysis of heat exchangers. Because if you are doing an iteration, for example, it's very difficult that you come each time to the graph, right? And read a new value and then go back and input that value. Go back and input that value. It's better to use the equations in that case, right? So we have the two options and we are going to solve problems with the two options so you can see um, which one you prefer. So if you analyze these plots and the table, you have this quantity NTU, the number of heat transfer units. See, NTU is here, is here, right? And it's also here, NTU, NTU, NTU. So what is this NTU? So it's a dimensionless group called the number of transfer units, right? And the number of heat transfer units is calculated by the overall heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the heat transfer surface area divided by the minimum heat capacity rate, either CH, the one for the hot or the one for the cold fluid, okay? So for an specified overall heat transfer coefficient and C minimum, NTU is a measure of the heat transfer surface area. So larger the NTU, larger the heat exchanger. Okay, so it can give you an idea of um, how big the heat exchanger is. So let's solve the problem then using, I'm going to show you first how to use this table. Okay, so the first NTU problem we are solving is using this table. So we have a shell and tube heat exchanger used to cool terminal 59 heat transfer fluid. And water at 25 Celsius enter the shell side of the heat exchanger at a mass flow rate of 80 kilograms per second. The heat transfer fluid enters the tubes at 90 Celsius and a total mass flow rate of 12 kilograms per second. The heat exchanger has two shell passes and eight tube passes. If the heat transfer surface area and the overall heat transfer coefficient are 21 and 1300 respectively, find the heat transfer and outlet fluid temperatures. So again, we have to use NTU, we have two missing temperatures, right? So let's get, we know, let's get what we know. We know the hot in, we know the cold in, we know the both inlet temperatures, we know the mass flow rates also that we are feeding to our shell and tube. Um, we need to get the specific heats um, based on the inlet temperature because it's what we have available. There's no option. So we are going to read the specific heats at the inlet temperature. So we have the, um, the specific heat for terminal 
at the inlet temperature and the specific heat of water at the inlet temperature that are our two fluids. As always, first step to solve with epsilon NTU is to get the heat capacity rates and determine which one is the minimum. So let's get the heat capacity rate for the terminal, that is our hot fluid. So mass flow rates times CP. Uh, that give us 2.2 times to the fourth. Let's get the heat capacity rate for the water. Mass flow rate of the water times CP of the water. That give us 3.3 times to the five. So if we now, the next thing is to determine which one is the smallest one, right? The minimum. So which one would be in this case the minimum? Terminal, right? Terminal will have the minimum heat capacity rate. So C minimum equals the heat capacity rate of the terminal. Uh, we need to get the heat capacity ratio, the minimum divided by the maximum. Why? Because if you check at your table, right, is something that uh, we need to know. This C star is the ratio of C minimum divided by C maximum. So I will need it later. So I'm going to calculate it. So I will get the C minimum. C minimum, uh, sorry, the C star. And I forgot here to write the star, but this is the C star. C star is C minimum divided by C max, 0 0.069. Now, uh, I'm going to get also the heat transfer units. Why? Because I need them also. And I think I have another copy, yeah, of this table here, right? I need both NTU and C star because they are involved in every single equation in this table. And well, I have a shell and tube, so most probably I'm going to use these equations, right? And both of them imply C star and NTU. So I'm going to go ahead and get them. Um, so NTU, overall heat transfer coefficient given, area given, C minimum, we just calculated, that is the one from terminal, 1.191. We have two shell passes, is what the problem says, you have two shell passes. So we need to calculate the NTU per shell, okay? So NTU divided by two, the two shell passes we have, give us the NTU per shell pass. We will be using equation 1028 from the table, uh, and we need to calculate an intermediate quantity, that is one plus C star squared to the one half, right? So we are going to use equation 1028. But check something. So this is for one shell pass, but we have two shell passes, right? So n shell passes, we have two. So we need to use this equation at the end. But if you see, this equation implies epsilon for one shell pass. So we first need to solve this one and then put the result of this equation into this one. So I'm going to get the intermediate quantity, one plus C star squared to the one half. So one plus C star, C star calculated here because it's the ratio of C minimum divided by C maximum squared to the one half. That gives me 1.002. So I can calculate the effectiveness for a single shell pass, right? With this equation. This equation is the equation you have in your table for one shell. And this equation has an intermediate quantity that is given by this symbol. I'm not sure what is this symbol, sorry. And um, so I'm going to calculate it also before I put it in this equation, okay? So it's NTU plus, multiplied by one plus C star squared to the one half. So I get this value of 0.5971. So I'm ready to put it in here, right? It's the one I'm going to put in here. So I put numbers to my equation because I have the intermediate quantity here that I calculated for, and I have this one. So the effectiveness for a single shell pass is 0 0.442. But we have two shells, right? So we need to calculate the effectiveness for two shell passes with the second equation, the equation 1029 in table 10.3. That is this equation where E1 is epsilon for one shell pass that we have in here. So if I put numbers to this equation, 
I get now the effectiveness for two shell passes being 0.684. Now I can calculate the heat transfer. Finally, heat transfer is going to be epsilon times the max, right? That is C minimum, T hot in minus T cold in. And that gives me a value of heat transfer rate of 1.02 megawatts. Now the problem says uh, we want to know also the outlet temperatures and we can get those from the energy balance, right? So, Heat transfer rate equals heat capacity rate of the hot times T cold out minus T cold in equals the heat capacity rate of the hot T hot in minus T hot out, right? So I don't know T cold out, so I can get it out of this equation, right? Out of this part of the equation, heat transfer rate divided by C uh, heat capacity rate of the of the hot, right? and then plus T called in. So T called out equals the heat capacity rate that we just calculated in the previous slide, divided by the heat capacity rate of the cold plus the temperature of the cold in. That gives me a cold out temperature of 301 Kelvins or 27.9 Celsius. And I repeat the same analysis, but now with the hot, right? I get hot out of this equation that is going to be hot in minus heat transfer rate divided by the heat capacity of the hot. So if I put numbers, I get 44.9 Celsius. And that's how you solve for a shell and tube heat exchanger using epsilon MTU method using the tables. So if you have a cross flow, well, you need to check the other equations, right? If you have a double pipe, you can check parallel or fl control flow and you use this other equation. So, that and most of the heat exchangers we will be evaluating in this course are the shell and tube heat exchangers because they account for more than 90% of the heat exchangers you can face in industry. Uh, with the how to use the, the graphs now, this was how to use the, the table. Next, uh, next class we will solve epsilon and to you using the graphs.